everyone. I'm thrilled to welcome Representative Katie Porter, who represents California's 45th Congressional District in Orange County. Uh, Congressman Porter is the Deputy Chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and has turned uh, congressional hearing questioning into an art form, as we all know. So um, thank you so much for joining us um, to share your insights on the plans for the CPC to advance our goals for Medicare for All in 2022. Welcome. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. I was actually just on um, a Congressional Progressive Caucus Executive Board meeting where we were talking about some of the executive actions that we want to press President Biden to do, including executive actions around um, our existing Medicare program, um, including things like stopping the progress of direct contracting entities, making sure that Medicare Advantage patients um, are not being taken advantage of. If I have to see one more of those Joe Namath um, advertisements, um, I'm going to poke my eyes out. So I um, want to really say thank you all for the work that you're doing on the ground in local communities, pushing for a Medicare all health system. When I first ran for Congress, I launched my campaign in 2017, and Orange County, traditionally Republican territory, still even numbers of Republicans and Democrats today, there were a lot of naysayers that I could not run and win on Medicare for All. I knew what was right, and I knew what it was like to be a patient, to be a single mom, to be an American trying to use our broken healthcare system. And I am so glad that I stuck to my guns with the support of so many on this call and listened to the families that I was asking to trust me in Congress, that I trusted them, that the healthcare system isn't working for them, that they're struggling to pay for care, um, that families are going bankrupt because they can't pay for the costs, even families with insurance going bankrupt. In fact, that's mostly who goes bankrupt, families with insurance. Um, and so I'm so glad that I stuck to my guns that I ran on Medicare for All and I'm proud to still be a supporter today. Before I ran for Congress, I was a consumer protection attorney and I taught consumer protection. And so I really think about our healthcare system from that consumer protection angle. And who are the consumers? It's very hard to tell sometimes in our healthcare system, but they are supposed to be the patients. So we have to put patients first when we think about what should our healthcare system be valuing and who should they be prioritizing. And instead what we see over and over again is profits being valued over people and corporate greed that goes unchecked. The reality for so many Americans is that they are paying more and more in healthcare costs to get less and less of the care that they need. And the outcomes tell the story. Americans have shorter lifespans and worse healthcare outcomes than virtually every other comparable country around the world. And in 2020, US life expectancy dropped for the third year in a row. That is the most sustained decline since World War I. And that is because of the negative health outcomes and the lack of access to care throughout most of people's working lives. These are problems that Medicare cannot simply solve magically when people turn 65 and are eligible to be part of our Medicare system. If we want to turn this progress around and be heading the right direction toward longer, healthier lives, we have to start expanding access to Medicare. Um, and so it's our current healthcare system isn't meeting our needs. And the proof, sadly, is in the mortality statistics for Americans. It has been 10 years since the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And during that time, in that decade, the number of Americans without health insurance rose. It has risen by over 1.8 million people as of 2020. And so today in the United States, there are roughly 30 million people who do not have health insurance. But I wanna highlight the even more millions, the, the many, many multiples of that who are underinsured. And these are people on plans that are entirely unaffordable. I like to say that the out-of-pocket maximum is completely out of reach. For many families, the deductible is completely out of reach. Um, and so those, the result is that families don't get the care that they need. And even now, in the middle of a global pandemic, we are facing an uninsurance and underinsurance crisis. And the COVID-19 pandemic has brought this into focus. We know as thousands of Americans lost their jobs, we saw businesses open and shut, 
people shifting jobs. The result was many Americans lost their health care and their health insurance during that time. And then they were unable to seek proper treatment and proper care. So the result is we have American workers who are having to navigate this pandemic without health insurance or without access to affordable health insurance. Um, and so I'm really proud to be continuing to press on this point as the deputy chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and to locate this fight for really meaningful change to our healthcare system, for structural change to our healthcare system in the Progressive Caucus's larger values around justice and dignity and peace. Um, we have worked hard to improve the traditional health insurance system. And the reality is it isn't going to get us where we need to be as a country, which is why the push for Medicare for all is so important. Um, and so even as the House has passed legislation to lower out of pocket costs, to expand subsidies for people on the Affordable Care Act, to attempt, we had hearings in the Oversight Committee on drug prices. Um, the reality is without that big structural change, we aren't going to see those big outcome changes that we want to see in people's health. Um, so it's really, really important that we continue to push for some of the reforms toward Medicare for All that were part of the Build Back Better Act. Now, as you all know, the Build Back Better Act um, is you know, virtually a four letter bill these days um, in, in Washington DC and around the country. Um, we're all frustrated that it hasn't gone anywhere, but there are important things in there that I want to highlight. The cap on out of pocket spending for seniors um, for prescription drugs so they would not have to spend more than $2,000 a year. That's a huge number as I say it, $2,000 a year for a senior. We need to get that cap passed, if not an even lower cap. Um, capping the cost of insulin at $35 per month um, for Americans and ending the ridiculous anti-competitive ban that prevents Medicare from negotiating lower drug prices. And we need to make sure that that change is as broad and as big as it can be. Some of the proposals that Congress has been debating would cover five drugs a year, 20 drugs a year, 30 drugs a year with thousands and thousands of drugs on the Medicare formulary, we can't solve the problem of unaffordable drug prices with a handful of, of drugs at a time. We have to open up the capacity of Medicare to negotiate all drugs um, and quick, as quickly as possible. And that's important not only to deliver the care and the life-saving drugs that seniors need, but also to make sure that we realize the taxpayer savings to our Medicare system so we can reinvest in expanding and improving Medicare. Um, and Medicare is so popular precisely because Medicare works. And that is something that I hear over and over and over again from my constituents, Republican, Democrat, Independent alike. Um, so I am pushing to allow Medicare to negotiate all drug prices, not just a handful of drug prices, expanding Medicare to cover dental, vision, and hearing, lower the age of Medicare to 60, um, to make sure that we're capping the drug prescription drug pricing um, in Medicare, the out-of-pocket costs for consumers, um, and working to stop efforts to privatize Medicare, uh, making sure that we're really looking hard at the data on Medicare Advantage to understand what kind of outcomes it's delivering and standing up to this movement toward direct contracting entities. Um, so there's really a battle right now for the future of our healthcare system. And, and that includes the future of Medicare. And on one side are corporate lobbyists, insurance companies, I like to call them big insurance, and the pharmaceutical industry. And they want to roll back the progress that we have made and they wanna make sure that we don't make any more. They wanna keep privatizing Medicare, they wanna keep opening it up for profits, and they do not want to focus on what should be the bottom line, which is the health of Americans. So on the other side are you, and you are joined by thousands and millions of other people who share the experience that virtually every patient has, which is that our healthcare system is broken. And you guys are the people who are organizing on the ground, who are lifting up the stories of patients, some of whom are too sick, too tired, have barriers to communicating. You are lifting up their stories and helping be in the front lines of this fight. A strong majority of Americans believe it is the federal government's job 
to ensure a healthy workforce and a healthy citizenry. And we know that a majority of Democrats support Medicare for all. So we need to be very, very clear as we move into 2022 in a very competitive election cycle, there's gonna be a lot of pressure on candidates to be safe, to be timid, to do what is in Washington the way they have always been done. But the reality is I cannot imagine running a stronger campaign than on a platform of saving lives. And that is exactly what Medicare for All will do. Full stop. Medicare for All will save lives. And it will save money. Can you imagine a better platform that I will save lives and save money for regular Americans around this country, regardless of where they live, of what they do, of their age? That is what is at stake in Medicare for All. So thank you for being the people who are on our side, who are helping to lift up candidates like me, who are helping to push this fight forward. We can't do it without you and your work that you're doing in local governments is so important to bringing along the groundswell. As I have cities in Orange County adopting Medicare for All resolutions and debating Medicare for All resolutions, it makes it so much easier for me and others like me as federal candidates to stand up and fight for Medicare for All. So thank you for what you're doing and I'm honored to be side by side with you in this fight. Thank you, thank you so much, Congresswoman Porter. Like always, you are so inspired we're so grateful for your leadership. And exactly, our message is simple. We are going to save lives and save money. And I, I love that. And I think we all need to adopt that. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I know you have to run to your next meeting. I'm going to make sure your staff receives some of the questions that folks have made in the chat. Um, and uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Absolutely. And thank you. And I, I'm going to scroll through the questions before I jump. But Please keep calling your representatives, no matter how red they are, no matter how conservative you think they are, no matter how much you frustrate them, they frustrate you, I mean, and you may frustrate them, keep calling because they need to hear from you about your support for Medicare for All. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, next, uh, I am thrilled uh, to welcome our star coalition partner from our revolution, um, Anna Marti, Anna Marta Visky, who has turned winning local resolutions for Medicare for All in New Jersey into her own art form. Um, Anna Marta, could you share how the local resolutions fit into your organizing strategy for Medicare for All in New Jersey and introduce us to Jersey City Council member James Solomon, who helped champion a successful resolution last month? Anna Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Melinda. Um, First, I just want to say it's so exciting to listen to Representative Katie Porter, uh, who is so unbelievably good at exposing the truth about just how common sense uh, this policy uh, is. So thank you, Congresswoman Porter. We need more legislators like you in Congress. And uh, in some ways, I believe that this is one of the reasons why we gather here as a Medicare for All organizing community, because we want to identify and uplift um, those voices of our allies uh, in the Medicare for All fight um, who are with us uh, already. Um, and we want to identify them at every uh, level of government possible everywhere in the country so um, that ultimately together we can pass this bill. So thank you again. Um, as you mentioned, Melinda, I'm Anna Marta Vishke. I'm a regional organizer with Our Revolution. I'm so proud of all the work we have done here in my home state of New Jersey where we passed 13 uh, local medical for our resolutions. We are the second uh, state after California in the number of resolution, re resolutions passed. And uh, what's important um, in this work for us as organizers um, in the series of resolutions we have passed that 13 resolutions means over 26 local government officials who are on record about their support for Medicare for All in New Jersey. We usually get at least two quotes uh, from, uh, from the sponsoring council members. Uh, the reason why we are counting and why uh, this uh, number is notable, uh, because only three congressional representatives in this deep blue progressive state uh, support Medicare for All uh, in Congress. 
Uh, so there is definitely a deep divide uh, and uh, we want to expose that uh, divide and disconnect between the grassroots and our federal legislators and we want to close this gap. Uh, the more communities pass these resolutions, the more uh, local electeds uh, talk about how common sense a uh, single payer would be and how it would help their towns, the bigger the bottom up pressure um, on the federal legislators to enact this widely popular policy that, as uh, uh, Representative Porter said, will save lives, will save money, and will achieve of course, racial, social, and economic justice across the board. Uh, so we have done um, some very intentional focused organizing here in New Jersey in key congressional districts so far. We have gotten a major victory last year in March 2021 when um, Frank Pallone, uh, the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and one of the most powerful Democrats in the country, my congressperson um, has uh, come on board with the bill. Uh, last year, we worked on Albio Ceres uh, in New Jersey's 8th Congressional District, uh, which covers big urban centers like Hoboken um, and Jersey City, where we passed uh, a resolution, um, and where the population is uh, majority Latino. Ceres has been a Medicare for All supporter in the past, um, and he was part of the Medicare for All caucus. There is no reason why his name is not on the bill yet. And while he's retiring next year, we will continue the pressure in that district um, and the organizing there. In 2022, we will also focus on the newly redistricted uh, third congressional district here in New Jersey, um, which is represented by Andy Kim. And uh, we are looking good to pass a countywide resolution in the third uh, congressional district uh, in Mercer County. So exciting uh, news, hopefully coming out of, uh, of uh, that district soon. And everywhere we pass these resolutions, we always aim to highlight the local issues um, and the local aspects of uh, our uh, current healthcare system, uh, the inequities in our current healthcare system. There were communities where we talked about our immigrant uh, neighbors who need healthcare, or in other places we spoke about um, unemployed uh, folks who lost their jobs with, um, lost their healthcare with their jobs during COVID, or uh, we spoke about the LGBTQ communities unmet uh, healthcare needs in our current uh, for-profit system or the low-wage workers who are vulnerable and who are likely to uh, be uninsured and die at higher rates of COVID. Uh, so there are so many ways to uh, highlight the disparities um, of our for-profit system and every conversation matters, every angle is important. Uh, and uh, before I introduce the Jersey City Council person, I want to just mention that today, um, as, uh, as Melinda mentioned, is an important day in the Senate as uh, the fight for the voting rights legislation unfolds there. And with healthcare, as with the voting rights, I think the solution is the same, only a large organized movement can um, overpower the influence of uh, corporate interest in the big money. Um, we need to continue organizing to make democracy work for all of us um, and to get the common sense legislation that we need passed. And we must advocate our interest diligently and consistently as we have done in the past. We have to grow this movement. We have uh, the public consensus behind us. Uh, throughout our powerful movement and grassroots organizing, we need to continue the pressure from the outside and create uh, the political will uh, so that Medicare for all can actually happen. Because as our motto says at our revolution, when we organize, we win. Uh, and with that, it is my pleasure to introduce um, the champion of our most recent victory in Jersey City, Council Member James Solomon, who was instrumental in passing that resolution. We knew that we can partner with James from the onset because as a council member, James always kept the interests of the working um, uh, people front and center, didn't yield uh, to the pressure uh, from the special interest. He made Jersey City the first city in New Jersey to pass a resolution calling on city and state pension funds, for example, to divest from fossil fuels. He passed legislation to regular Airbnb uh, in an effort to make the town more affordable and livable. And now James can count passing a Medicare for All resolution among his uh, progressive achievements. And we look forward to partnering with him as we build this movement for uh, justice all across the board. Welcome, James. Thank you, Anna Marta. And it is uh, a pleasure to be with you all. And I'm very, very excited to talk to you all about how we passed the Medicare for All resolution in Jersey City. Although I have a few remarks and bullet points uh, that I'll share with you, but I think after listening to Anna Marjo, you probably all have a good sense of how 
it really was passed, which was her extraordinary organizing work with her partners in our revolution that made my job as a city councilman much, much, much easier. Um, so uh, the work that they did was phenomenal. Um, I do want to just give a, a, a few remarks on just sort of how uh, we passed the resolution, what were some tips. So if you're considering a similar resolution in your uh, municipality, they may provide some actionable information uh, for you. Um, some context, Jersey City is the second largest city in New Jersey. It's almost 300,000 people. Uh, by a number of different measures, it's either the most diverse city in the country or one of the most diverse cities uh, in the country. And as Anna Marta said, one of our congressional reps who represents a portion of Jersey City has been a Medicare for All co-sponsor, but is not currently uh, one and is retiring. And so we will have a new rep in that seat who we want to encourage to be a leader on this issue and not someone who, uh, as Congressman Porter said, is uh, being timid and afraid of some of the special interests that might uh, oppose a more bold stance on healthcare. Um, the core to us passing it was the work that our evolution uh, did. I'm sure all of you know that legislative offices are understaffed and under-resourced. And so the easier you can make it for a legislative office, uh, the better it's going to be and the more likely that you're going to get it passed. So our revolution had a draft. Uh, they worked to get a uh, expert to come speak before the city council um, and worked on our press releases together and just created a really, really um, close partnership. It was also not the first time we had met our revolution. So a second a core piece of what made that partnership work was ensuring that uh, the first time I talked to Anna Marta was not related to this resolution, but work over time to discuss uh, sort of shared interests and shared partnerships. Um, last but not least was, you know, Anna Marta and our revolution was very collaborative with us on the city council. So we had our own concerns around the timing and the legislative calendar. We were able to sort of really work and partner together to make sure that what we did worked for everybody. Um, a next sort of very key high level for uh, how to pass a resolution was do everything you can to make it a win for a majority of members. Um, you know, obviously times as politics and politicians, we wanna be sort of the name on the top and get everybody to, to pay attention to us. But I think you really wanna make sure that as many members on your legislative body as possible think that this is gonna be great for them. So, I went and I talked to every single council member with my co-sponsor colleague, then Councilman Lavaro, and we got six of the nine members of the city council to be co-sponsors. We included everybody on all public statements related to the resolution, and we didn't exclude council members that maybe have a more conservative or moderate reputation. We really wanted to sit down with them and make the case to them that a Medicare for all resolution was the right thing for the country, the right thing for people, in Jersey City. And I do think from a tangible perspective, there were some council members that maybe are not, are not always aligned with progressive causes, but this provided a real opportunity that, for them to uh, demonstrate that they are listening and they care and they can be a partner with progressives in Jersey City. And I think part of the reason they're interested in that is the progressive movement in Jersey City is growing and becoming stronger. And we just had an electoral season where progressives didn't win the majority of seats, but did well and better than you would expect. Um, last but not least was coming through out of the pandemic, being able to sit with members and just talk about how their constituents, their friends, their family members have struggled with a private health insurance market that uh, can be just extraordinarily cruel. People going bankrupt, people staying in jobs that they don't wanna stay in that are not good for them just to keep their health insurance. And so being able to have tangible personal connections um, from our own experiences, from members in their district really made a difference in convincing them to join as sponsors. So just to summarize, I think the core on, you know, lessons on how to pass a resolution, have a really, really great partner that makes it easier for a legislative office with draft resolutions, speakers, um, and really just a great listening uh, partnership reach out to all or as many members as you can on your legislative body and try to make it a win for them and connect it to personal experiences of members within the district. And so with that, I thank you all for uh, taking the time to listen. And it's just the, an honor for me to be one small piece of this larger fight to save money and save lives.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Solomon. And thank you for, uh, especially for getting brass tacks and concrete and really breaking it down. This isn't, we really want to demystify this for, fo for folks yeah. around the country. And it's wonderful to have uh, public servants like you willing to kind of take this forward and, and be champions with us. So thank you so much. Uh, now I'm really thrilled uh, to move west from New Jersey to Pennsylvania uh, to hear about the terrific organizing and success achieved in the town of my alma mater, uh, State College, Pennsylvania, the home of Penn State University. Carol Byrne is a registered nurse and community organizer with Healthcare for All Pennsylvania, and she worked with State College uh, Council member Kathy Yeeple to win a Medicare for All resolution through the State College City Council last month. And this is central Pennsylvania. This is a, a, a very tiny blue dot in a, in a red part of the state. So it's really exciting um, to have that resolution passed. So Carol, uh, we'd love to hear from you um, and from Council member Yeeple about this organizing success. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about my backstory to um, passing the resolution and hopefully encourage people who have been at this for a while or who are experiencing difficulty. I've, I'm a longtime single payer supporter. I was active with Healthcare for All Pennsylvania for 10 years. Um, that's an organization that has had uh, legislation, single payer legislation introduced in the Pennsylvania State House and Senate. I decided to become involved in trying to pass a resolution in State College in about 2016 after Bernie Sanders' campaign. Every semester, there would be a small group of us who would sit and strategize about how we could make this happen. It seemed sort of insurmountable. A major frustration we encountered was that due to this being a college town, it's a very transient people who would be very active in leadership roles. One semester would have left town or be too busy the next semester. Our consensus in every group I worked with was that we would need to orchestrate a significant community um, effort in order for council to pass the resolution. And we just didn't have the continuity or the organizing capacity to make that happen for a long time. Um, I am a retired nurse now, but during that time, I was still working in home care and getting more and more frustrated as the private insurance industry um, made things more complicated for me and for my clients, especially those on Medicare and Medicaid. Plus, events in our town accentuated the dire need for better access to mental health care. Um, it was just... It was uh, discouraging and honestly, I got pretty burned out. But in 2019, things began to change. The borough council in our county seat, Belfont, which is a smaller town in a redder area, passed a Medicare for all resolution. And this was almost entirely due to the effort of the borough council president, uh, Joanne Tostavesi. She showed her council members the um, single payer documentary, Fix It. And she also presented data on how um, single payer legislation could provide potential savings for municipalities. Then after um, that resolution was passed, she presented that resolution to the Pennsylvania Municipal League, which is a nonpartisan organization um, that works to empower local uh, governments and make them as effective as possible. So at their 2019 meeting, um, elected officials from over 40 towns in Pennsylvania voted unanimously to support the single payer resolution. And some of these towns were from very red areas. So um, that was very encouraging. And I would definitely say to anyone, don't assume because you have a conservative uh, representative or council member that they won't uh, be able to listen to or be in favor of Medicare for all. Then in October 2020, my good friend who is also a nurse, Kathy April, was selected to fill a vacancy on our borough council. She's a hard worker and she um, took this on. I can't say enough about her. Um, so I will let Kathy tell the story about how we actually got this passed. 
<clears throat> My name is Kathy Abel. I'm a registered nurse, as Carol said, um, and I served on council from October 2020 to December 31st, 2021. Um, so um, we passed the Medicare for All resolution on December 5th, uh, just, just recently, last month. Um, and, and that's thanks to the grassroots efforts of Carol Byrne, uh, who's been at it for, I wanna say six years or more. Um, uh, and also because uh, of the help of um, people like Melinda and Brittany uh, from uh, Public Citizen, um, they uh, started working with us about seven months ago, back in May, I think, Melinda. And um, um, we were kind of back and forth and um, I needed to understand the issues um, better. And so they pointed me towards resources. Um, and um, so once you educate yourself, then you realize why, why, does it, why should a small municipality do this? Because it makes sense. Everybody loves Medicare, Medicare works. Um, Congresswoman Porter talked about the inefficiencies of our current system. And as, as a nurse, you know that it's not working. Um, Medicare works and it is efficient and it's equitable. Um, and um, we have to aspire to do better. Our healthcare system is broken and we have to do better. Um, will it, it cost you political capital? Maybe, um, but we still have to aspire because I believe one thing leads to another. Um, we have 35 million Americans without health insurance. That's just unacceptable for a country like ours. Um, so one equity and two um, efficiency. Uh, so how did we do this? Um, I said it took about half a year. Uh, um, Melinda and Brittany provided us with technical assistance. Um, they also, like I think around Thanksgiving, um, said, hey, would you guys like a form for a petition? And so they helped us create a form where people could sign up. We got it's a rough time around Thanksgiving. People are on vacation, but we got about 60 uh, participants to sign up and their comments were just heartbreaking. You know, like um, uh, one mom um, was saying her adult daughter aged out of their employer health insurance and, um, you know, had a lot of, it's great that there is an affordable care exchange, but sometimes it is inadequate. And um, she had friends that were going to order uh, insulin from um, other countries because it was so in inaffordable. Um, so, I mean, you probably all know uh, people who've been affected by healthcare costs. Um, um, so I did my homework. Uh, I talked to other council members. Um, it's very helpful to get a co-sponsor if you can. Um, uh, two weeks before the resolution was going to be presented, um, one of the council members decided that um, she was gonna oppose it. Um, and so the council president, <laughs> bless his heart, uh, stepped in and co-sponsored. So it, couldn't, it could not be taken off the agenda. So that's, that's important. Um, Let's see. Um, so uh, I guess um, that is how we got it done. And I would just, just say aspire to do better. I think it's, and this is really important. Melinda will tell you, this is all about um, getting a buzz on in the community and spreading the word, getting, uh, educating people. Um, so uh, uh, it was a great experience. And um, I, I, you know, let's aspire to do better. We can do better. Thank you, thank you so much, the council member Eiffel, and and thank you, Carol, uh, for you know for sharing sharing that, you know just that it that it requires a lot of persistence sometimes, and we are very grateful for your persistence and for um, and for the creativity. And I, of course, was very pleased that um, that State College, where I have a personal connection, um, passed this resolution as December. And I think it's especially wonderful for us to make the case for Medicare for all in purple states like Pennsylvania. Um, and, um, and we are, you know, this isn't just happening on the coasts. And I think that's important. We have Knoxville, Tennessee, we have South Bend, Indiana, where, you know, we're, we're building this case all around the country, which is super powerful. Um, and now heading back to the West Coast, 
Um, we're thrilled to have with us uh, Rochelle Pardue Okimoto, who um, is also a nurse. Uh, there's a theme here, nurses know what's up <laughs> um, and why we need to uh, change the system. Um, she's also the former mayor and council member of El Cerrito, California, and she's been doing amazing work in reaching out to city councils in Northern California to pass resolutions in support of both Medicare for All and CalCare um, AB 1400. So thank you so much for joining us, Rochelle. Thanks, Melinda. Thanks for the introduction. So yes, I have been a nurse for 20 years, and most of that time was spent on the floor uh, working as a newborn intensive care nurse. And now I work for the California Nurses Association as a nursing practice representative. And I want to give a shout out to all the nurses out there um, in California and beyond who have been working on this issue for literally decades. And you know, we, we don't give up on our patients and we're not giving up on Medicare for all. We're just gonna keep at it until it happens. So here in California, we've been working on AB 1400, which would implement the first single payer program in the country. And we are over the first hurdle, like Melinda said, we passed the health committee last week and tomorrow we go on to the appropriations committee. Um, so send out all your good vibes for us because we need it. Um, and while serving on the city council, I was able to pass um, a couple of resolutions in favor of single payer health care. And I remember at the time, like it felt really good, but at the same time, I was like, eh, did this do anything? I don't know. But now that I've been watching uh, AB 1400 move its way through the assembly, I know that every time an organization or a city passes a resolution, it really, really does make a difference. And so it's so important to get out there and get these resolutions passed. Um, so what happens is it places some pressure on your local assembly members and senators. Um, and then of course, you know, going all the way to, to Washington, your Congress members. So, you know, they, they don't want to be out of step with their constituents and they end up wanting to do the right thing. So in California, um, the resolutions that have already been passed um, have gone to the health committee and are now being looked at by the chair of the appropriations committee. And you know that the hospital industry and the insurance industry and the pharmaceutical industry are all sending in their letters of opposition. So it's so important to have that counterbalance, to have our voices out there that, hey, you know, people from all these municipalities want uh, Medicare for all, they want AB 1400. Um, so uh, also 27 now, 27 cities. Am I right, Melinda? 27 in California? I think, it's, I think it's 28. 28? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I, I tried to count, but I maybe missed one last night. So 28 have now uh, passed resolutions for AB 1400. And uh, like we said, the list is growing and I'm doing my part to help grow it. And I really, I really wish I would have started a little bit earlier. So learn from my mistakes and get started on this now because like I said, wow, how important it has been. I started in December contacting, you know, all my former contacts that I could. And so I reached out to 20 cities and I've gotten positive responses from 10 of them. And I even have one really incredible success story from council member John Wizard, who is from Seaside, California, who was able to turn around real fast and pass a resolution. And it was even there to go to the health committee and his letter is going to the appropriations committee. So thank you so much, council member wizard from Seaside. Um, so while I am a former elected official and I reached out to all these cities, of course, you know, you just have to reach out to your city. Unless you wanna contact all the cities, you know, that's up to you, but um, just, you know, focus on your district, your city. And if, you know, you don't understand how much power you actually have as a constituent. Use it. Um, a good council member will have their staff right back to you. And in a little city like mine in El Cerrito, the council member or the mayor themselves will 
likely right back to them themselves because in little cities, you don't have staff. So you just you look at all those emails yourself. Um, I would encourage you to write them and um, to ask for a meeting if necessary, you know, really get out there, push your agenda. Um, council members are elected by you. They're there to work for you. So please hold them accountable. Um, furthermore, some council members might need education on the topic. Maybe they don't really fully understand what's going on. So as the activist for Medicare for all, you are the perfect person to instruct them. And don't take no for an answer. It's easy for someone to say no via email or behind closed doors. So go to public comment and make sure that, you know, everybody hears about Medicare for all and don't let this issue die. Just keep, like I said, be tenacious like the nurses and just keep at it, keep at it. Um, and most importantly, don't be nervous. Council members, mayors, Congress members, they're all just people like you. The only difference is they decided to run for office. So your work on Medicare for All is super important and collectively we will get this thing done, even if it takes just one city at a time. So thank you so much and keep working. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Rochelle, and for all your amazing activism and service both in and outside of local government and especially as a nurse, as we know just how indebted we all are to all nurses right now, especially in this pandemic. Um, I hope that you've all been as inspired by the creativity and tenacity of all of our speakers and all of the concrete tips that they've provided. Um, so now we, you know, we did get started a little bit late. Um, so we're going to run over just a few minutes, but I do want us to take a few moments for all participants to share with one another. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Brittany, to explain how this part will work. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Brittany Shanahan, and as Public Citizens Medicare for All organizer, I dedicate my time to working with activists like all of you all around the country to pass these resolutions, including, and I don't think anyone mentioned it before, there's 28 resolutions for um, AB 1400 and Medicare for All. They were basically passed in a year. So that was like a lot to get done in a year, which is really exciting. Um, since our last webinar in December, we've passed resolutions in Jersey City in New Jersey, in Osseo, Minnesota, in California, just since uh, December 8th. And remember, this is like, in spite of the holidays, we passed three resolutions um, in uh, Petaluma, in Seaside, and in San Mateo. Uh, so we are now at 90 resolutions and we are just getting started. I hope that the, the breakout uh, sessions, I think they were short, but um, next time we'll hopefully have a little bit more time. I think it was great. I know the, the, uh, the group that I was in, it was a, a nice conversation to be able to connect with folks. I think this has been an extraordinarily energetic meeting, uh, meeting and evening. Um, of course, I really uh, want to thank Representative Porter for taking time out of her busy schedule to join us and to fire us all up and give us all the great messages. Um, and special thanks to uh, council members Solomon and Yeeple and former Mayor uh, Pardue Okimoto for sharing their insights and passion with us. And I really you know, wanna thank um, each of you who stuck with us uh, through this and or have been with us uh, for months or just getting started with us um, to share your updates and your ideas. This is really how we're building a movement together to win guaranteed healthcare for all uh, through the big fight that's happening at the state level in California over the coming days uh, and our longer term strategy to continue to build support in Congress. We'll need to win healthcare as a right for everyone living in this country. So please, uh, those of you who volunteered, if possible, if you can submit the Google Forms or email us with any notes or interesting insights and who uh, spoke up in your, in your uh, session, you can please, please sign up on our map um, at uh, your community uh, where you can see where there are resolutions underway. Um, and if your community is not on there, put them on and we will try to connect you uh, with folks um, around the country. 
uh, or in, in your community, because this is really about kind of building from from the grassroots and so that we can build the power that we're going to need to win uh, and to win this fight, which we know is just so urgent. So again, we went about 10 minutes over. So I thank for folks um, who hung out all this time. I know there, there's a lot more going on and we really appreciate all of your time. And uh, please, please uh, reach out to us and we are here to help you. So thank you, thank you all. It's great to meet everyone tonight.